I'm sure that by now you've heard a wealth of op-eds and talking heads herald the rise of artificial intelligence. And along with that, you've probably heard a cascade of risks that we're gonna face. Risks from AI becoming some nightmarish immortal dictator that we'll never escape from, to uh, philosophical questions surrounding AGI and superintelligence, to the end of work as a product of automation, and fully autonomous weaponry. The media has tended to focus on these mid to long-term threats, while in my view, neglecting an extremely imminent, if not already in process, risk. The risk that I'm concerned with is one affecting our well-being, our mental health, our beliefs about the world. In this talk, what I want to do is I want to get us all on a common ground concerning what we mean when we say artificial intelligence, where we're interacting with artificial intelligence today, and the kinds of risks that arise from that interaction. So to begin with, what is artificial intelligence? Well, this contemporary wave of progress in the field has really been fueled by a subfield of a subfield called deep learning and neural networks. A neural network is just a program consisting of a set of neurons, which are wired together. At one end of the network, we'll feed in inputs. At the other end of the network, we'll receive outputs. So on that input side, we can feed in any sort of data. For instance, we can feed in pictures, and then we can ask the question, is a baby in this image or is it not? In the example on the screen, you can see that the network's making a mistake. It's claiming that there's no baby in an image which clearly contains a baby. So that brings us to the second point of using neural networks, teaching them, training them. So what we do is we simply let the neural network know you're making a mistake, and then we step back, we let the neural network reconfigure itself in some way. Uh, in the example on the screen, you'll see removing connections between the neurons. And as a product of this change, the correction occurs. The neural network is now expressing the correct function. So there's this two-step procedure. You specify some network, some objective rather, you ask it to do something, and then you step back and you let the neural network come to its own solution, its own solution strategy to solve the problem you posed. Okay, so that's a bit about how neural networks work. Where are you interacting with them today? So there's broadly two categories which you can kind of lump your interactions into. The first are these companies that want you to uh, buy some product. The second are the companies that collaborate with the first category to keep you on platform and serve you ads. I'm gonna focus on the second of these categories, these social medias, these content delivery platforms. This is where we, we spend an immense amount of our time. We spend hours of our day interacting with neural networks. So how do neural networks play into these platforms? Well, on something like YouTube, the primary method of navigating the site is this sidebar, which contains recommendations for the next video you should watch. This is completely determined by a neural network. On a platform like Twitter, your home feed, this aggregation point of all the accounts that you follow, is being filtered and re-ranked according to neural networks. Similarly, on Instagram, those posts that you're presented with, the order in which they arrive is decided by a neural network. Okay, so this is where we're kind of interacting with these models. Uh, what's the risk? Well, we know that the content you consume has a massive impact on your well-being. It affects your belief about the world, your mental health. And there's this famous, now infamous study conducted by researchers at Facebook and Cornell, which seeks to address the extent to which emotion contagion exists within digital social networks. So emotion contagion, it's this idea that when we're presented with other humans expressing an emotion, we ourselves will begin to experience that emotion. Interestingly, you don't necessarily have the ability to recognize that emotion is external to you. you. You believe that it's authentically your own. And so what these researchers did is, without informing users, they manipulated the news feeds of 
700,000 accounts. And the way they manipulated these news feeds was to bias them towards more positive or more negative content. And then they would record how those manipulated users' own posts changed in sentiment. What they found was that there was an overwhelming positive correlation with that manipulation. So if I go and I serve you a bunch of negative content, your own expressions, your own communications will become negative, similarly for positive content. So I mentioned that this study was infamous, and it's infamous on the level of there are some strong questions about the ethics of the conduct of the study. And there's also some questions about Facebook's chosen conclusions to draw from the results. But the work stands as an extremely compelling piece of evidence for the hypothesis that simply by manipulating the content that you consume, you can have immense impact on the well-being, the mental states, the beliefs of your downstream users. Okay, so I hope that the pieces are starting to fall into place for how this current setup, this current framework that we exist in has risk. The content that we consume has massive impact on our well-being, and yet we've outsourced that role to AI, to neural networks. Okay, so let's take a step back and let's think about how we train neural networks. So again, we specify some objective. We ask the network to do something, and then we let the algorithm arrive at its own solution. Well, what's the objective that we're specifying for these content-serving networks? They broadly fall into two categories. The first is engagement. Engagement is the probability that you'll interact with a piece of content I serve you. Maybe you'll like it, you'll comment on it, you'll reshare it to your friends. The second category is time. And so how can I serve you content in order to keep you on platform, which will give me, the company, more opportunities to serve you ads, which means more opportunities to make money? So, I want to talk about this second category, time. This seems like an immensely risky choice of objective to optimize. Humans have this natural pathology of addiction, and we're explicitly optimizing for them to spend time on one thing. And remember that neural networks, they're going to take whatever strategy they come up with that's most effective at achieving their goals. And if our goal is time, we really need to ask the question, what if addicting, enraging, depressing our users is the most effective strategy to keep them on site, engaged, engrossed with the content. I think that's a very plausible hypothesis. And so the next question we can ask is, okay, well, what sort of frameworks exist at the moment to keep track of this risk or even to mitigate it? Unfortunately, very few. But there's an extremely simple and familiar framework that we can rely on in order to kind of defend against these risks. To begin with, consider your total user pool of your service. On Facebook, we're talking about more than two billion users. Now, separate a small baseline pool uh, and call that, call that your baseline pool. And this baseline pool, what's gonna happen is there's going to be no interaction with your model. So for these users in this baseline set, they're not gonna have their feeds ranked by a neural network. It's gonna be very simple, straightforward algorithms like uh, sequential serving. Okay, the next thing we can do is we can track these metrics of well-being on both pools, and we can compare them. These metrics are being tracked in real time, continuously. So when we see these metrics begin to diverge, when some gap appears, we can take active measures to try to minimize that gap or reduce it. These active measures might look something like reducing the impact a model has on users' experience of the site. So this framework, it's, it's incredibly general. It could be applied to pretty much any content-serving platform or social media that exists today, but there's still two core issues or questions that I have with the setup. The first is, well, what's a metric of well-being? You know, choosing metrics is an incredibly difficult thing. I really don't think 
that computer scientists should be trusted with coming up with the fundamental metric of well-being. We're the ones who came up with time in the first place. So where I think this is going to come from is a cross-disciplinary collaboration between computer scientists and statisticians and ethicists and philosophers and social scientists. I think that this kind of, this issue is approachable and we can make concrete steps towards solving it. So that's the first issue I see with this framework. The second question I have is one that I don't have an answer to and I'm gonna leave you with today. So when I was talking about taking some active measure in order to close that gap between the metrics, I was talking about population level dynamics. So we're tracking these metrics on aggregate. We're tracking among all the model facing users and among all the baseline users. And then when those two pools shift in some way, we're taking an action across all users to try to correct for that. But that's not the only option. We could track metrics on a per user basis. So we could watch each individual user. We could see how their metrics begin to shift from some baseline or from perhaps their historical average. And then we could take a per user action to uh, push them in a different direction. I see a massive potential for good in this framework. You can imagine a suicidal user. If our metrics can pick up on entry into a depressive episode, we could take steps to try to mitigate risk. Consider the fact that suicidal humans are about 0.1% of the population. If our intervention is only 1% effective, at the scale of Facebook, billions of users, we're talking about tens of thousands of lives impacted. So massive potential for good, but consider what we have to accept if we build frameworks for this. We're allowing companies to track our mental state and then actively encouraging them to manipulate it. It's kind of this Huxleyan nightmare. So I see both the potential for massive good and massive risk. I don't know where the balance falls, but I think that points to another major problem. There's not a public discussion surrounding these issues. These systems, these content serving systems, they've existed for well over a decade now, and yet there's no regulation. There's no discussion of the types of checks and balances we'd expect to find in a technology of this maturity. If there's anything I want you to take away from this talk, it's a call to action to speak to your family, your friends, your teachers, your politicians about these issues. Build an opinion through discourse. Your opinions are sorely needed, and we, the ones implementing this technology, we desperately want to hear them. Thank you so much for your time.